Tonight on The Best Times, we profile Forever Young, an organization that takes World War II veterans back to their battlefields. We discuss the impact of the squeeze between boomerang kids and the sandwich generation. And we'll tell you how to recognize the warning signs of strokes. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Over 70 years ago, the battles of World War II raged across Europe, North Africa, and the islands of the Pacific Ocean. The greatest generation gave the best years of their lives to fight for freedom. Although we can never adequately repay these aging warriors for their sacrifices, there is an organization called Forever Young that grants the wishes of World War II vets who want nothing more than to go back to the battlefield. Seventy-one years ago, this was Earl Williams' view of Utah Beach. As a 21-year-old staff sergeant in the Army Engineers, he came ashore in the third wave of the invasion forces. And I'm glad I didn't land first, because there was a lot of people got hurt that morning. It was just a different world. There was nothing that you would do even think about doing in civilian life. I'm 92 years old, or 93 in a couple of months. And I lived most of my life in three weeks right there, the last three weeks in June of 1944. Today, the view from Utah Beach is very different. And it is precisely that difference, the stark reality of the past, contrasted with the peaceful serenity of the present, that draws these veterans to return to the battlefield. Diane Height is the founder of Forever Young, a nonprofit organization that began with the mission of fulfilling the wishes of senior citizens. We started doing wishes for World War II veterans because they were seniors and we just saw miracles taking place in their lives. And I realized then that these men had gone to war, they came back, made America great, and they have never asked for anything. And so I thought, I can make a difference in their lives. So we changed our mission from senior citizens to senior veterans. Forever Young focuses primarily on World War II veterans because time is running out for them. Today, Forever Young raises funds to take veterans back to their battlefields. And so far, they've taken about 20 trips. We have been to Normandy four times. We've been to Belgium, where the Battle of Bulge took place three times. And we've been to Pearl Harbor twice. And we've sent an Iwo Jima Marine back for the 70th anniversary. W.T. Hardwick hit Utah Beach as a private in the 4th Division. He fought his way inland, but on the fifth day, he was captured in the Normandy hedgerows. He spent the remaining months of the war as a POW, being forced marched across France to Frankfurt, Germany. For 40 years, he never spoke about the war. Didn't say a word to anybody about what I'd went through. My parents never did know what I'd went through as a POW. Even after 70 years, these veterans suffer from nightmares and the post-traumatic stress of combat. The last one I had, 
Uh, I, it's just all unbelievable how, I mean, the guys are talking and everything, you know, it was just, just like you were there. And when I woke up, and I kind of laughed at myself, you know, for and how long it had been since I'd had one of them. But I never did go back to sleep at night. I couldn't get that off my mind. Having witnessed the horror of war, suffered through nightmares, and never spoken about it to those closest to them for 40, 50, 60 years, why then do these vets choose to go back to their battlefields? I always said that I'd never go back there. And I don't know, my wife passed away five years ago, and, and I've got one daughter. And she went over there on vacation, her and a friend of hers, and went to Utah Beach. And when she come home, she told me, she said, Daddy, you've got to go back over there. When I walked out on Utah Beach, I literally broke that real emotion. And I still get tear-eyed talking about it. You were just remembering all the things that... Yeah. Yeah, when you walk out there, when 68 years ago, you could just see it all happening again. I was afraid of how I would act, you know, emotionally because I can get to thinking about it and talking about it and almost tune up even now and that's as long as it's been. And, and to see it again, it just completely changed. I'm sure glad I went that time. I sure am. I think going back really does give them closure because when they're thinking in their minds, they're thinking about their buddies dying, bullets, fear, destruction. Well, they go back and they just can't get over this restored land and the appreciation and the beauty and the peace. So when they come home, they're thinking, totally differently about the war. I mean, when they think about Normandy now, they think of beauty and peace. So it really does heal them in many different aspects of their lives, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, it really does make a difference for them. As old saying, I've heard said so many times, I wouldn't take a million dollars for what I've done and I wouldn't do it again for two million. Millions of boomers are finding themselves squeezed between caring for aging parents and continuing to support their adult children who've moved back home. They are the sandwich generation. In 2012, a Pew Research Foundation survey revealed that 36% of 18 to 31 year olds were living at home. And the research firm Hearts and Wallets reported that over one third of boomers were providing financial support to their adult children and family members. There's a financial and emotional cost in the squeeze between the boomerang kids and the sandwich generation. Let's begin by talking about this generation that's squeezed, mostly boomers, I guess, squeezed between the aging parents mm -hmm. and the boomerang kids, the millennials that have come home. Is this a new phenomenon? And, and what trend is driving it? Is it new? It's not necessarily a new phenomena. I think it's been around for a bit of time, but I think what's driving it now is that the younger generation isn't necessarily leaving as soon as we might expect them to. 
so they're staying around a lot longer. So you have people, uh, parents in that middle generation being squeezed far longer than they expected to because of those boomerang children. As parents were probably wondering, I think you're right in that assessment, but we're probably wondering why are our kids hanging around? What are your thoughts on that? Well, part of it's uh, economic driven. Um, the, 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 the economy is more competitive for new jobs. Uh, older workers are working much longer and not opening up spots for, for, for new recently uh, minted graduates to, to get those jobs. Um, and, there, and people are working longer because so many people are living so much longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so while all of this is not a new phenomenon, there's just a lot more people in it now. And um, some are better equipped than others really to deal with it. Have you seen that in, in your work? We have. Um, we have been planning for increasing life expectancy for many decades in our firm. So we really, we were kind of prepared for that part and helping aging parents. That's just part of the deal as, mm -hmm. as a population. Uh, we've got three clients over 100 now. We have nine clients in their 90s and they're not new. They've just been with us decades and decades and decades and they're, they're still with us. But the, the, the returning millennials is relatively new. I and mean, uh, there were always a, a few, but that percentages have, have really exploded in the last few years. And, and what are you seeing in your work? Uh, absolutely. We see more and more employees come to us with concerns about their children, concerns about their parents, uh, work stress, trying to work towards their own retirement, yet at the same time they feel a lot of both emotional and financial pressure to be there for their children and to be available for their aging parents as well. Is there more stress from one side or the other, the parent side or the child side? I guess it really depends, but I think that more uh, parents feel like they have greater responsibility to launch those children than the aging parents. And if your parent is aging well without a lot of health issues, then there's not a lot of pressure there. But once your parents' health starts to decline, then they feel a great deal of pressure to provide support for them in their medical care. I would imagine that in a way, uh, one can expect a parent's health to decline and you might have to help that parent mm -hmm. in their old age. Not so necessarily with your children. You do expect them, they get to a certain point in their lives when they're young adults, and they're gone. They're supposed to be gone, right? Right. right. <laughs> and they don't go. <laughs> so I, I would imagine that's one of the stress factors, isn't it? I, it is one of the stress factors, but surprisingly, parents spend a great deal of time trying to launch those children regarding, regardless of the age because the children's success um, is the parents' success. So they spend a lot mm. of effort, energy, dollars to launch their children to be successful people because then they too feel like they've been successful parents. That gets me to the question of the guilt factor. Is there a guilt mm -hmm. factor involved there too? I think there's a guilt factor involved somewhat in that. I think there's more of a guilt factor actually with their aging parents because they're spending so much time and money with the children who are probably like mid-20s, mid to late 20s at this point. They're spending so much energy there that they're feeling a little guilty that they're not spending it with their parents who may need them a little bit more based on their medical issues. Let's talk about the financial issues just a little bit because this seems like a recipe that could ruin your retirement. It absolutely could if you, if you lose sight of the importance of keeping your own financial independence as a, as a priority because you, 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 I mean, health issues for aging parents that are uninsured or underinsured can be extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, while at the same time, the, the uh, Chinese water torture of a child who doesn't leave and the health insurance issues and the car insurance and the filling the refrigerator, those things, they're, they're not as big, but they just go on and on and, and continue. And you just start wondering, connecting the dots as if they, they're never going to end. And I would imagine some people are in situations where they know they have to delay their retirement mm. in but order to in order to cope. They with this do, situation. and there's always some resentment uh, that comes with that. You know, we talked to you mentioned uh, with the millennials. Uh, should we just say no to our kids? I mean, is that an option to just say no to them? 
there comes a point in time where no is a complete sentence in and of itself <laughs> to your children. And um, you, th there comes a time where that's appropriate. So now, certainly if you have children who have um, disabilities, health problems, mental health problems, you want to be um, aware of the support that they need. But um, for other children, there comes a point in time where you want them to be successful, gainfully employed, looking for their own place. Um, you know, it used to be where kids would go to college and then they'd graduate from college and they'd launch into some career. But now kids are going to college and then coming back home and then maybe staying there for a period of time or successfully out on their own, losing a job, some type of uh, financial situation occurs and then they come back home. So they've been successfully gone for a couple of years and then they come back and that's even harder. That adjustment is much harder. Well, as a, as a parent, how do you cope with that? Certainly, I think you need to be open and honest in your communication with your child about what the expectancy is here. So if your child is coming back into the home, what's the length of time you're going to allow this to happen? What are the financial responsibilities of that child living in your home? Are they paying rent? Are they paying a portion of the groceries? Are they doing their own laundry? Our job is to help them become independent. It's not to coddle them at any age. So those lines of communication need to be open and very clear. I would suggest that there even be a contract. And it certainly doesn't have to be a legal contract, but there be a discussion around the table with written things down, you sign it, I sign it, and, and let's move on. Have you seen situations like that? Our perspective is usually limited to the financial side of it. And our approach is to say, we want to help you achieve the, these goals, which is at some point being financially independent. That involves you doing X, Y, Z, usually saving a certain amount of money. We call it PYF, pay yourself first. After that is done, if there are resources left over to help children, fine, that's fine. But it's a matter of prioritizing, which is if you allow that to overtake all the other, uh, other goals because those things are further down the road, you can get into trouble quickly. Does this squeezed situation affect men and women differently? I think it does. Women tend to take on a little bit more of the emotional toll of the squeeze generation in addition to doing a lot of the uh, caretaking of the aging parents. So women more often, now certainly men do this, but women more often are the ones who accompany a parent to a doctor's appointment or to grocery shopping or whatever it is that, that they may need. So um, it, it certainly impacts them in, in, in those ways. And then when you're working with a couple around these issues, um, they may have differing opinions as to what should happen with their children. So you might have one part of the parent wanting to provide more for the child than the other parent wanting to provide. And so now there's um, disagreement and, uh, you know, sometimes it impacts the marital relationship a a as they raise these children. Is, is the answer in situations like that to get together as a family, to talk it out? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like you have to have everything out on the table and open. Absolutely. You know, open communication is key to solving all of these difficulties, but we don't always work in a society or in families where open communication is the key. So I certainly think that that's a coping mechanism and is a successful strategy is to sit down and hear from all parts of the family. So, Dad, what do you think about this? Mom, what do you think about this? And hear from the kids because they may have a great point and maybe a compromise is the best solution here. Are there, are there support groups for something like this? <laughs> I have not heard of a support group for, um, for the, the boomerangs, but I am sure that out there, we, there's so many home care agencies that certainly offer supportive groups. There are caregiver support right. groups for, Care, for that right. side of, right. of the issue. But not necessarily not for the, the millennial boomer. Side. I think that's called happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps so, perhaps so. Maybe I was going to ask you how you cope with this. Maybe that's the way you do it. But let's close out with your best advice to someone who's in that squeezed situation. So don't forget your own health. Don't forget your own emotional needs. If you always do something with friends on a Thursday evening, make sure you continue to do that on a Thursday evening. Take care of yourself. And you said, obviously, pay yourself. Well, that, uh, and remember that the best gift you will ever give your children and your parents is to 
very fiercely guard your own ultimate financial independence. Because if you jeopardize that in, 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 to take care of them during this time, they may or may not choose to repay that down the road. Um, if, you, if you guard that independence, everything else you know, will, will, will usually fall into place, but you've got to really guard that fiercely. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for being on The Best Times. Nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Almost 800,000 Americans will suffer a stroke this year. It's the number five cause of death in this country. And yet more than a third of Americans can't identify even one of the warning signs of stroke. Can you? Knowing more about strokes can save lives, maybe yours. What is a stroke? Well, stroke is a very common uh, and devastating condition. It's the number one uh, leading cause of permanent disability in adults in the United States and worldwide. It is caused by either uh, disruption of the blood flow to the brain by a blood clot that blocks the uh, brain vessel or by leaky vessel that produces bleeding to the brain. Unfortunately, we live in uh, southeastern United States, which is the also known as stroke belt of the United States. So everyone who is born here is twice likely to experience stroke in their lifetime compared to the same uh, ethnic genetic make uh, born anywhere else in the United States. What are the types of strokes? It's called ischemic or hemorrhagic, these are the terms. So ischemic stroke is the one that where blood clot lodges in the brain vessel uh, kind of in the wrong time and the wrong place and precludes blood flow to the brain uh, or um, uh, bleeding to the brain occurs and that would be hemorrhagic stroke. And uh, this type of stroke is usually caused by high blood pressure and the wear and tear of blood vessels and, and then they break off and leak blood flow. What are the symptoms? Uh, what uh, people need to know is uh, FAST. Abbreviation is FAST. Face, arm, speech, time. So droopiness of the face, weakness of one side of the body, speech disturbances when the person cannot get the words out right, the person slurs words or, or finds the wrong words to express themselves, and then time. Time is of the essence. So the first 60 minutes from these symptom onset, whether it is transit or not, the first 60 minutes will largely determine how the person spends the rest of their lives. Who is at risk? The combination of uh, high blood pressure, overweight, lack of exercise, uh, uh, poor dietary habits, and uh, predisposition to these events because those things tend to run in the family. So, uh, and these are just very few risk factors. I'm not even talking about smoking and some other obvious things. What treatment is available? The only uh, medical treatment that's capable of reversing this disability is called uh, a tissue plasminogen activator, TPA. Simple way to remember it's clot buster. So, if someone has a stroke, you need to ask, bring me to the center that gives clot busting medicine. In Tennessee, we're hoping to have uh, the system statewide uh, geared up like trauma. So you don't bring trauma to the nearest walk-in emergency room, you bring it to the trauma center. So equally so, we would like to have um, uh, certified stroke centers in the whole state mapped out so the EMS know exactly where to bring the patient. This truck is part of the future that's changing the outcome for stroke patients in the Mid-South. The Mobile Stroke Unit Ambulance is on the streets of Memphis. On board is a portable CAT scan capable of identifying a stroke within the vital first 60 minutes of an attack. That technology can potentially revolutionize how soon we can treat. Because now imagine instead of driving to the hospital, you can at the same time as you dispatched uh, a first responder, you, you tell the mobile stroke unit to drive to the place 
and quickly load the patient, literally in the driveway or in the parking lot, from that uh, primary responder to the uh, ambulance that has a CAT scan in it. And then we quickly do the scan and we uh, quickly uh, draw the bloods and we're ready to treat. For more information about strokes, go to the website of the Stroke Association. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to best times at WKNO.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.